last time we talked more about the problems and we'll, we'll just review the problems and kind of look at solutions to, to motorcycle design problems. Uh, so tonight we're, we're going to take a look at the solutions as a review. Um, the whole idea behind the, the crash ratings and the, the design uh, ratings of, of safer crash designs really has to do with research that was done where we get hurt before we even leave the motorcycle. And uh, once we leave the motorcycle, we know we're, we're, we have trouble perhaps, but the, the collisions, just to remind you guys, review you what they were, you got the first collision is hitting the object, which is a double whammy once the wheel hits the frame. And I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about this because there could be something that can be done to, def, to help with the second hit in the design. And of course, then we have the rider hitting the motorcycle. Okay, you can imagine if there's a windshield and all kinds of doodads in the front of this bike. And then so we could hit maybe something with our face or whatnot. And then the rider hits an object that that object could be the ground. OK, ideally, that's what it would be. Uh, and so those were the those were the three hits. And so we, we have to come up with solutions during this phase uh, of the crash because this person's barely left the bike and they they're already potentially uh, hurting. And I think, you know, one of the initial uh, types of crashes I talked about in 2016 was the car turning left in front of you. OK, and, and a forward crash. That's really what all this is, even though you could apply some of the stuff to just cornering mistakes. But um, but it, it, I also have thought about how this really does impact us on, you know, the back roads, too. I mean, if you come around a corner and there's something in the road that you didn't expect, uh, you're going to be in a forward collision. OK, and so uh, we need to be thinking about these things. And, and, and oh, by the way, in, in those remote areas, if we were to, you know, catch the, the, the rear quarter panel, you know, of a car backing out of its driveway and we get hurt, it could be more difficult to get us emergency services and things like that in these remote areas. And so it really is just something that we should be thinking about. So the goals, this was from last time as well. So we want you, you, saw, you saw the video. So now the goals of crash design, better crash design should be to slow the rider's forward momentum before impact. So actually, I take that back. There are certain things that can slow our momentum before we hit the object, because remember, the faster we're going, the more kinetic energy there is going to be there. So that the inherent design of a motorcycle um, that, that can maybe perform better to slow the impact to slow the rider before the impact uh, is something to be very much considered. And then of course, when the act actual um, crash happens, diffuse the energy from the rider optimal. I remember last time I said, you know, it's, it sounds like the wrong thing, but it's better if the rider is thrown clear. Okay. Rather than uh, that sudden stop into something. And I think I showed Mark Marquez and this is a very gentle, um, very gentle crash. I can say that because I'm not in his leathers, but I mean, figuring he crashed his bike probably at 30, 40 miles an hour, at least in that turn, where he sort of gets in trouble there is he, he tumbles a little bit and his head might hit. But again, before his head hit, he'd slowed down considerably, right? So he's, he's scrubbing speed off here. And then, you know, when he does hit again, that hit right there probably was the worst of it. And that could have, that could have, I know he's got trouble with his vision these days. So he's got his bell rung a bunch of times. Um, but now then we talked about the difference between this rider in traffic in a forward crash. They have all kinds of uh, potential problems there. Okay. So, so those are the goals basically diffuse the energy. Now, me go to so this was a review of the design features that I had proposed based on what I read um, in in the uh, you know research that I looked at and as I thought about these things you know sometimes I get an idea I put it in there it's not what the research said but um, it, it tried I try to make sense of the information so if we take a look at the the criteria that we would have a design based good or bad just on the showroom floor, 
this is what I had at the time. Now, there could be other things. Real scientists could come up with more or even less, but uh, maybe different ones. But um, the primary thing that really made a difference in these studies was the slope of the tank being gradual. And I think if you remember last time I spoke of this, if you, or you've seen the video or someone's heard before, you just think in your mind, a, a CB750. I mean, the tank was very low. It wasn't a hump tank. Over the years, we've had more humped style tanks. And so a gradual slope is going to be better than a, a steep slope tank. Airbags, I'm going to show the video one more time if you're not convinced about that uh, versus no airbag. Spoked wheels tend to absorb more energy than cast wheels. Longer wheelbases. Uh, this, again, was one that was a very kind of a minor thing, but they you know, in the research, they thought longer wheelbase motorcycles would be a better design to keep the wheel down, the rear wheel down. I had done some more research. Well, I looked at my information um, and I, I think it's to keep both wheels down to help slow, reduce your stopping distance, total stopping distance so that you could get the, you know, less kinetic energy into the crash. But again, I'll let the researchers speak on behalf of why um, less rigid frames. Again, a more rigid frame is going to not absorb energy, naked versus ferret or windscreen. So nothing in front of you, ABS versus non-ABS, and then the lower uh, horsepower and top speeds. Okay. So um, again, this, you know, there was one expert, I won't say his name. He's one of the, you know, main guys uh, out there. Uh, and he said, your bike sounds like it's not fun to ride. You know what I mean? It's just, it, uh, the, the, you know, I, I can't, I don't really, the person's changed, you know, somewhat of their tune. I've talked to them since about it, but you know, their idea was, well, I don't think it's a good idea because I don't want to ride a very slow bike with, that's not the things that I want, but you're going to, but today uh, you might see that there are some popular designs and it, it is, the, it's the direction of the designers to take us there. We buy a lot of things because they present themselves in front of us. Okay. Not because we dreamed up. I mean, could you have dreamed up a, you know, a KTM adventure now, the way it looks No, with the, you know, but people like the look of it. Some people hate it, but the point is they're in charge of the design directions. Now uh, I just have a note. There are some combinations go together. You're going to find that there really isn't a perfect bike, but the speed, the speed's exponential. If you guys remember that, right? So crashing it at 40 or 50 miles an hour is better than 80 or 90 miles an hour. Okay even though that's pretty horrible uh, of what it's, what it could do to you. So let's, let's just go to um, the airbag again. Once again, you know, you have people downright laughing at airbags on motorcycles. Some people wouldn't buy a motorcycle without them. Probably. I'm sure there's a gold wing owner out there that says I, I must have this. Okay. On the motorcycle. But I just want to remind you when we talk about, remember diffusing energy in the crash, this is very important. So watch what the airbag does. I mean, with and without is like night and day. You can see the energy absorption pushes the rider up. It's diffused here. This one, it's just, you know, you park yourself right into that vehicle. And I think last time we talked about the injuries and there was, a, I think there was a, a, a retired emergency room nurse here who said exactly that's the problem. Okay. And you could see, um, and I, I think last time I mentioned that the, the difficulty is where's the person going to be? How's the motorcycle going to hit the object? And all these factors have to be taken into um, under advisement when they're designing the airbag. So again, these are problems. I mean, but Elon Musk is putting a rocket back and forth to space and everything. I mean, we, it's not like we haven't had airbags on cars since the 1970s, which I'll get to in a little while. Okay. So airbags are, I, I think very important. Okay. And I, I'm surprised that more motorcycles just don't have them. Maybe just people don't want to pay for it. Um, or they don't see the need for it. But, um, I mean, I think you would all agree with me that, there hasn't been an elimination of forward crashes, right? I mean, motorcycles are still running into things in, that are in front of them. So why wouldn't this have been more developed after so many years? We'll talk about that a little bit later. Questions or comments so far?
So last year, New York City had 51 motorcycle deaths. 43 of them were single vehicle accidents. Out of how many? 51. So this was in the city? In the city limits. Would they go over to curbs or what was it? They hit a park. UPS truck. Um, they just hit a bunch of cars. But they yeah. were, they were, it was a forward crash. Mostly. Yeah. Well, yeah, because you know, something pops out of a, pops out of an alleyway or something, Lauren, right? I mean, it's, mm-hmm. but you're right though. I mean, it, the, the one that MSF study with the 100 riders, and I think they found that we run into things from behind. You know, everyone says, oh, you're going to get rear-ended. There's a risk there. But I think the study found out, the Virginia Tech study recently, you know, that we're running it. A lot of us are running into vehicles. So isn't the crash point the problem with the airbag vest? So I'm going to talk a little bit about that because, see, when we talked about last time, the airbag, if this person had an airbag on, let's say this person has an airbag vest. Let's go back to this one. The, the rider on the left, let's say they're wearing an airbag vest, okay? Has it gone off yet? Probably not, right? Unless it's, you know, one of these electronic systems that's really fancy. But a lot of them are tethers. You got to get pulled off the bike. Right, or you don't know where to tether it because you don't know where you're going to hit. Right, so, so the whole idea behind the airbag, it's good for the, remember that when you get thrown clear, that that's... For the third hit, the, the rider thrown hitting the ground or an object, that's when the airbag kind of is, is, in, is shining, okay? Now, um, just, just to go through here, we'll do a little quick evaluation. We'll take, it from the, uh, we'll take it from the top to bottom here real quick. So I opened up last time with the two top left uh, rows of bikes there, you know, the, the ones with and without riders at the top left. And I kind of asked, well, what's the safer bike? Uh, with the top row. And then the second row, I said, well, who's going to be more injured in a crash? And so if we, if we start to take a look at those original questions, yes, the, um, the, the top row that the newer motorcycle has probably better brakes and that kind of thing, but it's also faster, right? So it's going to have higher horsepower, higher top speed, probably than that uh, old BMW there. And you can look at the, the, the tank slope and the things in front of you. Um, and then of course the, the Harley rider versus the guy in the multi-strata. So, so, I mean, are there any in the bottom half of this screen here, what are just some of the, the better designs, the not so good designs, none really are like home runs, but what would be a a good design when it comes to gradual slope? Oh, the Hayabusa. Yes. Yeah. So is that, is that going to have a good tank? No, I guess the Ducati's a little better. Ducati's a little better. I mean, what would be the best? Probably um, that BMW X650 or G650 down there, right? Because it's the it's like almost like a dirt bike seat. Um, the Grizo, which is the uh, underneath um, the bad column there, the first one there, it's like, like a black and um, gold, black and, and red. Like that's pretty flat. But again, none of these are are probably perfect but some are better than others remember the 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 more slope the tank what actually happens is it pins you so it holds you up from getting thrown and then we can get those brain um movements and and um also that pelvic problem now when it comes to airbags none of them here have it i don't see a gold wing there um now some have some have okay yeah the the griso does also have the spoked wheels Looks like it's got a longer wheelbase. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so it, it so those meets, are meets a few of the uh, the uh, pluses. Right, it does. It's a. It's probably not a super stiff frame, relatively. Right. Yep. It's naked, uh, and uh, th- my Grizo was a 2007. It didn't have ABS, so again, it's. Getting the mix of, of everything on one bike is very difficult. Uh, and so there's, as you look at bike models, you, you can kind of tell which ones have better left side than, than the right side. Okay. So we're, we're, 
we're kind of getting in the mindset that we can we can kind of look at a motorcycle and tell. And again, like, like I said last time, um, when M Wendy Moon wrote the article, one of the first lines I think in the article was, you'll never look at motorcycles again after you read this article. And so we can just kind of get a visual of what would be the worst hump tank. Um, and and the, uh, the, the spoke wheels are also very um, kind of obvious to see. Now, these are motorcycles that when I made this presentation, I was looking for popular motorcycles that had what I put as good design, right? So now, now remember, they don't all have all the features. You can't find all the features on a motorcycle on a single uh, model that I've noticed, or I haven't looked in a while, but I'm pretty sure uh, there isn't one silver bullet that, that has all these things. But uh, you can kind of, you know, you can kind of see, uh, I mean, like the hyper motard, I think Jack, you just bought that, right? Yeah. So that is a popular design, not for everybody, but I mean, the seat is in line with the tank. This is so they, they've probably sold thousands of these motorcycles because they're popular. And the same thing, if you look at the scrambler, the yellow bike. Um, you know, again, it's kind of a retro style. So the tank is a little lower because that's what retro bikes had, as you can see the Harley Sportster, you know, what else? Um, I mean, these are good designs here. So again, what are you noticing? Um, mostly, mostly we look at the spoked wheels because by the way, I think that's a, a pretty simple way to absorb energy and then the, the gradual slope tank, but the other things can go back and forth. Uh, with the horsepower and that kind of thing. But you can see um, even the, the bagger right in the middle uh, of the screen there, there's not a whole lot of windshield or anything up front with a relatively slow tank. So um, the point behind this slide is they can make motorcycles that people want to buy that can integrate these um, these design features what are some of the things you, that manufacturers can can do so that we don't even have to think about this the basic issue with the tank shape i think is a big one uh, right and ducati is very guilty of that but if you look at the old st and the old super sports and any of their sport bikes it's got an extremely vertical front edge of the tank the the tank is the big one if you're someone who rides in the city Okay, like Lauren was saying, I mean, maybe that's an important thing you look for, you know, because you're commuting in, in a in a huge big city with traffic everywhere. And maybe maybe that's a primary a primary factor uh, that you look at what manufacturers can do. These are the people the 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 engineers. All right. I mean, every day car manufacturers are figuring out how they're going to make safe for cars. What are the bike manufacturers doing? Well, besides the electronics package, I think I was very, very appreciative from the beginning of this today and last time uh, about their efforts to make the crash avoidance systems. OK, the the electronics packages can't be beat. Um, I, I think they're doing an outstanding job there, but they've sort of turned a blind eye to this here. So the first thing is the gradually slope fuel tanks work on this. Right now, if you cannot get past fuel tank design, I know you're putting uh, fuel in them. A lot, a lot of fuel now is under the seat, right? So people still want to see a motorcycle tank. So maybe we make them crumple zone tanks, okay? Or we, um, or we, we do something. It's not a fuel tank there, okay? The fuel tank's under the seat, but it looks like one. And, you know, maybe we make it so that that thing is like a, it gives a little bit. Uh, some energy absorption materials are from the rider, okay? Be, be it the tank materials or some other thing. It's hard to do this because you need sturdy materials. I mean, if you've ever like tipped your bike over and if you picked it up, you're like, man, this thing's pretty sturdy. You crash your bike in a ditch, you pull it out. Um, and it's like, I can't believe I'm riding this thing home. They're made quite well. Well, if they were made, you know, uh, out of paper uh, or, or, you know, that kind of thing, they, they wouldn't be able to 
um, withstand the abuse. But I'm saying, can we put something that absorbs energy in front of the rider? I don't know what that would look like other than airbags, but more spoke wheels. We see this. Um, a lot of people don't want a tube in their tire. So they, they go for the, the cast wheels. Well, now you see a lot of um, manufacturers making tubeless spoke wheels. All right. So, I mean, I, my particular BMW has cast. Okay. I bought it used. It didn't have spoke wheels on it, but uh, I think people um, off road like them for various reasons. This, this, if you remember the second hit, so what happens is we're going to hit the object with a wheel and then the wheel's going to get pushed. The forks will bend and push it into the engine. And that's a, like a double whack. And again, anytime I think we had the guy uh, last time talking about this, the, the emergency room nurse saying that's exactly what happens. You, your brain just keeps going back and forth, back and forth because of multiple um, hits that, that happen in succession rapidly. So to prevent the, the front wheel from just coming straight back into the engine, maybe it's deflected in some way by design, okay? Some sort of wedge. It would be ugly probably the way I'm thinking of it, but make it so that there's some way that the forks, when they collapse, that they twist or something, you know? So if I'm going to hit head on into something, why do the forks have to come straight back? Is there a way the fork could be pre-fractured uh, in a direction that doesn't give us the second hit? Uh, the second... Um, the second thing is engine deflection. So uh, if you get into a front um, in a car, when you get into a crash, if it's a really nasty front end crash, engines are designed to get pushed under the car. And, and I guess many of you, probably all of you can remember um, cars from the 1970s, you know, where um, that engine would just get if in a massive front end crash, the engine just gets pushed right through the engine compartment, you know? Well, today in cars, they're designed to be deflected down and under the car instead of into the people. And so I don't know if a collapsing fork and wheel is enough to offset an engine, um, you know, to, to deflect it off. So that's not such a hard hit, you know, again, this is for the engineers out there. Uh, I'm just, you know, kind of saying what might work here. And then quality brakes and tire standard, you know, this is, goes to price points on motorcycles where, um, you know, it's going to be more expensive to put more expensive brakes and tires. So, but those are the things that are going to slow the, the rider down, but it maybe prevent the crash. But if they run into something, uh, make it, make it, uh, that they do it at a slower speed. Then this is the big whammy here. This is so we, we, we have the Goldwing airbag, but I had found this. Uh, there are vehicles out there with airbags that are external to the vehicle. So they come out of bumpers. They come. They actually they're not in the occupant compartment, but they're exterior to the motorcycle. So um, imagine, OK, maybe people don't want to um, have an airbag that is right in front of them but maybe there's something that can be done. You know, like if you look at the screen here, I'll circle, maybe there's an airbag that comes down here. Okay. That shoots down here that uh, prevents the second hit. Again, I just thought of that now as we're talking, I mean, you put some real smart people in a room, they're going to come up with ways we can, you know, try to have these airbags uh, diffuse some of that. If, you know, think of an air, think of outside the, outside the box with the airbag. Uh, now you can see here, this was an example of one popping out of the seat, which kind of scares people, um, scares me. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to be sitting on it, get ejected or, have, you know, our privates are there, you know what I mean? So this does cause some concern for those kind of things. What I'm looking for here is maybe what they call passive designs which are kind of invisible to the user, right? So we could imagine on this motorcycle here on the top, those airbags don't pretend they're not there. Now you're looking at a hyper modern motorcycle that could be attractive to people. Is this really too far a bridge to cross to get this, this type of design onto our motorcycles? And, you know, uh, the, we, we call the thing on the left a scooter or the thing on the right a motorcycle. Well, this is the frame on the BMW and this is the frame on the Honda. So that motorcycle, um, that frame is shared by something that looks like a motorcycle and something that's a scooter.
All right. So this is the actual, just the body is different. The, the, the motorcycle itself is, um, you know, any, everything, but the, but the plastic is basically the same motorcycle. And, you know, I was, I, I just, I, we talked at length. I remember when I was giving the presentation about why there, why there's no airbag here, why this is a storage trunk. Why couldn't we do, you know, wait, hang on, do, uh, do this. Why couldn't there be something that comes out of the storage trunk on this motorcycle? You know what I mean? Uh, well, and, and oh, by the way, that Honda motorcycle, Honda brand has the airbag on, you know, they have the only airbag. Like it's, it's not like they're virgins to the airbag concept on a motorcycle, but for whatever reason, probably economics. Okay. Probably because of dollars and cents and, you know, marketing prices and things like that. They had to keep this motorcycle at a certain price and they just couldn't figure out how to make it work up there. But um, I just thought that was a pretty, th there's crossover happening is, is what I'm saying. And we have an, uh, we have an ability to, to reinforce an airbag perhaps. And then this is the Honda Navi. This is a, it's kind of like a, a Grom junior, right? So this, this is a, uh, it just came out and they're, they're very small and slow. But does anybody know what this is based off of? The frame and everything? Well, similar to the ruckus, right? Okay. See how that the yeah, yeah the, the motor okay is attached somewhat to the um you know to the drive system itself. It's like a different type of vehicle altogether. And so I'm just saying there are there's opportunities to reinforce to provide energy absorption in front of the riders, um, be, you know, cause we know they're innovating. Okay. We know that the manufacturers are innovating. They've been doing it here. Okay. They've been um, using economy of scale to build a scooter around the country and the motorcycle in different parts of the world um, for a long time. And, and they're still doing it up till today, you know, with this motorcycle here, of course, this is a, a little bomb around scooter, but um, it, again, it could be, why couldn't this be, you know, brought up to a larger size now the, so that has, that, that's what can be done now. What can riders do? Right. So riders don't have, have a lot to say on what the manufacturers build, but they do have a lot of saying which motorcycles they buy. Okay. And you know, if something's not selling, well, they scrap it and they sell something else. Eventually the market kind of decides what people are going to buy. Now uh, the first thing is people can make purchase choices um, with their overall design and features, you know, you can, you can buy that safer motorcycle. Okay. But then again, what, how do we know what's a safer motorcycle? I mean, I'm, I'm hit sitting here trying to explain to a small group of people, um, even 200 people on a YouTube video um, that have seen it about what to actually look for. So nobody really knows what to look for. So I wanted to make something is an example, okay? So that someone that that, that is uh, in a qualified position, like NHTSA, okay, the the car rating safety people, um, you know, so that they could take over and do a better job. I took the information from the information, the research that I looked at, and then I sort of made a little bit of a criteria checklist. I used basically the um, same concept as the, as NHTSA does with their, um, with their rating system. You know, they don't really give stars anymore. They give, you know, poor ratings, uh, good ratings and marginal and that kind of thing. And so I decided to, to take a look at the features. And of course, uh, this rating system, again, was based off of the technology from 2016 when I made it. Things could have, could, could have changed. I looked at it before I came on tonight with you, and it looked fairly up to date. I, I really thought it was a good comparison on where sort of we could be because 
the motorcycle industry follows the automotive industry. Okay, so they do. It, it's very similar. Okay, look at LED lights. They came out on cars first. Now they're on, you know, motorcycles. So the airbag was invented in 1953. It took 20 years to get into the first car. Right. So now 1973, we had it was in uh, I think it was a Torino or something like that. I can't remember. The, it was a Buick maybe or something. But uh, in 1973, imagine buying a car with an airbag in it. It must have it must have had so much power behind it. You, you wouldn't want it to go off. Probably you'd probably rather have the crash without it. But um, the first one was invented then. So you figure our first motorcycle with an airbag was the 2006 uh, Goldwing. So 10 years after the first car, we had five car companies offering airbags, right? <clears throat> Which means if we were lockstep with the auto industry's pace, we would have in 2016, we would have seen some more manufacturers join the party with the airbag, okay, in whatever form it was. Now, when we talked earlier about like government mandates and this and that, and blah, you know, I understand, you know, a lot of times you, it's a double edged sword, okay? Do we want the government to mandate things that could protect us, but we want freedom? I'm saying if the motorcycle industry saw this trend, maybe they would take ownership of it instead of the government mandate, which seems like that's the only thing anything gets ever gets done in, in, in transportation safety. So if you come down to, if you extrapolate out, so what was this 20 years later? So from, yeah, 20 years later, so five car companies, it took 20 years to get the mandate of it. Okay. So all the cars had to have them. So that would mean that all motorcycles would have them in 2036. And then it, it, I guess in 2014 or whatever, um, you know, it, uh, just past here, you know, see, point where airbags saved so many lives or whatever. I'm more concerned right now with, with the, the left side of this picture. Okay. Cause I see the trend. I see what the trend is. I see that we're lagging. That's fine. We're lagging quite considerably. But but if you look, where where's the other manufacturer? Maybe it was. It's just not a um, a, a commercial success for for uh, the Goldwing to have the airbag on there, and that probably is what's causing it. The government's not nagging them, so no one's really. It's not on anybody's radar. But I showed you the video earlier. I mean, it is, if you crash your motorcycle into, you know, a, a minivan turning left in front of you, would you rather be on the airbag with the, with the, the uh, Goldwing with the airbag, or would you rather be on anything in your garage right now that isn't a Goldwing with an airbag? I mean, frankly, if I knew I was going to run into something, I'd wa I would want to be on that Goldwing with the airbag. But like everything else, we take the risks and we pick different things. Okay. We choose the model that doesn't have the extra, you know, traction controls or this and that, because it comes down to dollars and cents and what the risk is. But, um, so, so I, like I said, I'm just looking for, for someone to care in the motorcycle industry to resolve this airbag problem. Now, uh, if we go to, let me just explain how, uh, a person could, Again, I assume no responsibility if someone goes out there, uses this to help them buy a, buy a motorcycle, then has a mishap, okay? And I said the thing was safe because of this. You know, I, there's my disclaimer, okay? Um, you know, it's in there. Uh, it, it's in there somewhere, I'm sure, because this, I am not the authority on what's going to protect you in a crash, <laughs> okay? Let's be clear. But these are the things that could be considered when you are buying your next motorcycle. Uh, so the way it worked out was I have good, acceptable and poor ratings for different features on both crash worthiness and crash prevention. Again, crash prevention um, 
they they do a pretty good job on that with like just ABS, for example. But let's go to the crash worthiness, which nothing exists out there um, for a motorcycle crash worthiness except this. But so if it has an airbag, what I, what I decided was I got good, then criteria, acceptable, then criteria, and then uh, criteria for poor. And then I called something a super feature because I just thought that this was such a major uh, component of these two ratings, crash worthiness or crash prevention that had, if this is on your motorcycle, then it's probably the best you can do. You've topped out on this particular vehicle. Uh, and so the only thing, so with airbag, if it has an airbag, yes, it gets a super feature rating on the airbag. If it doesn't, it's no. So virtually every motorcycle out there is going to get a pour on the rating for airbag. Uh, according to the tool that I have simulated or made here. Now, the, the, the slope, if it's level with the tank, let's say the hypermotard jack has, you know, that's probably going to be as flat as you're going to get your tank. Gradual slope, moderate slope, severe slope. So what I actually made here was I, I actually put <laughs> angles. I just kind of, I'm not sure I got to, I would have to read on how I came up with these angles. Uh, I'm pretty sure most of it wasn't arbitrary. Um, I think there was certain research that said certain slope angles. Again, I didn't invent the stuff people are talking about. So I think that's where I came up probably with this first one here, 20% or less or whatever the slope was that they had said was, was problematic. Uh, I give you like feature uh, explanations on how and why this is, I put it in here. This is just a little little table, but this kind of explains more about um, the, the logic or so behind it or how to do the, the, the slopes there. And by the way, this is at cra my, my website. You just go to crash ratings. Spoke wheels again, spoke cast, carbon fiber. Okay, that started to become uh, a thing. Um, so you can see what would be poor. Then you got the two choices for frame, double cradle or, or the twin spar, trellis, whatnot. Fairing, is it naked, windscreen, full front fairing? You know, we're talking the gold wing, okay, without the airbag or something like a bagger uh, or, or an RT, BMW RT or something like that. Now, I want to show you how, how you're supposed to, like how that the points add up and things like that in a minute. But when it comes to crash prevention, the, the IMU, Yes, is a super feature because that's going to do as, as good a job to stop you from crashing into something as um, is anything is, is having the computer intervene to prevent you from from making that mistake, if possible. You know, I mean, if you're going fast enough and you screw up enough, it, it doesn't matter what the computer says. Again, ABS and traction control are simply just a yes and no. And, you know, a good or poor. I, warning systems. Again, I'd have to go back in time to think about my logic. I, I didn't. Um, there, if you're told something, if it, you're told that it's icy out, or you're told that your tire is losing air, okay, like any information you can get is, for, you know, from the motorcycle itself that could prevent a crash. You know, remember, crash prevention is what we're talking about here. So, warning systems. Now, wheelbase, again, depending on the wheelbase, okay, the longer, the shorter. Again, this is a, a minor thing that, that could make a difference. Top speed, again, and, and look at this. I got a good rating as a motorcycle, less than 99 miles an hour, okay, or less than 100. It's kind of like um, now you can see some of the motorcycles that go. I know people that are here tonight that have owned or own currently motorcycles. I think they can get over this um, with a little bit of monkeying around in the um, uh computer chip or whatever, maybe even just stock. Same thing with horsepower. All right. Again, I'm not saying we can't ride fast bikes, but I'm saying that if you want to prevent a crash, ladies and gentlemen, if you're accelerating fast, I mean, speed is the number one problem we have. One of the most, one of the biggest problems we have as motorcyclists is speed. Um, I have had motorcycles where, you know, I knew I'm, I'm doing something wrong here. Um, because I'm going too fast, but it's just too easy to do. And so I'm not saying we got to take ride slow bikes. I'm just saying these are 
the the I start with priorities. If you look here, okay, airbag, tank slope, wheels. You know, I, I'm I'm putting the priorities near the top of these things, where is down at the bottom may not be as much. And I represented in the points, okay, total kind of evaluation that um, that uh, as well. So how one would, you know, basically this is just a calculation thing where you're going to come up with a number here. So <clears throat> anything that you in your crash worthiness that you gave two points to, or I'm sorry, that you gave a good rating to is two points. Anything, you know, whatever the rating was for that item, okay, for, for of these things, whatever rating you chose, you know, let's say you're in a place, you just put an X through this, you know, wherever it is, okay, or you're at, you're at home, you put an X through there, you see where you are, and then a good overall rating, because again, none of them are perfect, <clears throat> would be five plus points. A poor would be below two, two or less uh, on the crash worthiness, the crash prevention. The points are a little different <clears throat> the way I weighted them, but a good uh, point, a good is two points. Ex um, acceptable is uh, one and then poor is zero. And then again, you can see, and again, it's just more of a, of an objective view at how safe a motorcycle can be, but still subjective. Because there's no there's no research behind what I'm saying here makes a safer motorcycle. But <clears throat> I think it's I was hoping it might be a starting point for people to think. I mean, obviously, um, if you take a, 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 a flatter tank slope. Yeah, that's only going to help you if you run into something in front of you, really. I mean, and I know people that have gotten. Um, into forward crashes that didn't have a lot of problems at all. Okay. I know a guy who uh, hit a, in, he, a van did a U-turn in front of him. He ran right into it. Okay. And I don't even think the guy went to the hospital. Okay. So, and he was on a, a, a tank slope bike. Okay. So, you know, it was like a sport bike. I think the bike itself was like a ZX 14 or something like that. I mean, it was a monster and it had a huge tank. He ran into the side of a minivan and, and, you know, he, he turned out to be okay. As far as I know. Now, then again, he's not telling me and he's not giving me his, uh, you know, medical history, nor do I want it. I'm just saying. Um, so, so that's at the website. If you want streetskills.net, uh, you can just click on crash ratings and that's going to be there. But this was even without this, you know, just knowing what we talked about. Um, just knowing what we talked about. Uh, tonight you, you can think about certain things so that was the first thing any questions do we know what motorcycles are made today with airbags i think it's only the gold wing if they I, I would have to go to their website to see i don't think there's any anybody can making um the airbag is still offered okay good thanks paul paul looked it up honda gold wing is still offered it's probably a uh um an uh, option, maintain and improve your riding skills. So we want, if we can avoid the crash, that's what the, that's what the ABS traction control IMUs are trying to do for us. They're to try to prevent the crash. So if we don't have a crash prevention rating on our motorcycle, well, we can be the crash prevention rating by becoming as good a rider as we possibly can. But I know probably all of you have taken advanced training advanced classes. I, as a matter of fact, I know all of you have, because I know the people in here. So it's now, are we going to use that training? Are we going to use that information like ride slower? Um, it's, it's very hard. Okay. I'm not saying any of this stuff is really easy. I mean, it's hard to get training. It's hard to fit it in your schedule. Uh, it's, you know, we want to ride our bikes. We don't want to like be constantly, you know, in school on them. But the ride slower. And, you know, again, this is something that I'm dealing with in my own riding group. Because remember, think if we're going 30 miles an hour through an intersection, if we just drop to 25 miles an hour, the kinetic energy uh, is, you know, I think, remember, it, when you double the speed, you quadruple the kinetic energy. So a five mile an hour difference going through an intersection, if you were to hit something does make a pretty big difference. But again, I'm not trying to lecture people say, listen, you guys need to ride, just, you know, get a very small motorcycle, go 
when out when nobody's out there, never go fast and always go below five miles an hour below the speed limit. You know, I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is consider your speeds might be getting faster or too fast and then increase awareness that just has to go with distractions. Remember, we want to slow before the crash as much as possible, and we want to maybe prevent the crash. So, you know, this again, if you have a bunch of motorcycles, I, I, I'm victim of this tool mentality um, to see if I can squeeze more life out of a tire. But um, you can definitely tell, I mean, when if you have worn tires and you do quick stops, and then you switch to a newer tire, put a new tire on, you can notice a difference. I mean, new tires do work better than almost spent ones, you know? So um, changing the tires before you get to the wear bars, I mean, I'm not saying like a lot further away from the wear bars, but I'm saying um, once you get to the wear bars, I mean, at that point, now the tire is, is really fighting to keep you, you know, keep you on the road when it comes to like water dispersion, moisture and stuff like that. So, um, I try to do this. I, I would rather change a tire before I need to rather than not. And again, not because I feel like the thing's going to be showing cord because I think we all know people that have ridden pretty far on cord showing. Okay. Like a little spot. It's not something usually people are proud of, even though some are, but, um, it just has to do with the performance of the tire. The performance of the tire, even if it doesn't pop and blow out on you, it's it's not going to do its job. And you got you, which is a couple hundred pounds, maybe on top of a 500 pound motorcycle. Some of these things are 900 pounds and you're, you know, you got a tire that's just not able to really help the motorcycle slow and stop. So just something to think about. And I know tires are expensive. Trust me. <laughs> um, consider what's installed in front of you. You know, this is another thing riders can do. Uh, if you're going to put something in front of you, it should be something that will break away, give way. Uh, if, if you were to get, get, you know, tossed into it, you know, so just think what's in front of you. If I were to go forward on this motorcycle, um, is, is this thing going to cause problems for me? If you raise your seat, you effectively remove the tank slope a little. Also, the airbag vests or neck braces. I wear a, a Lee at neck brace. Okay. It's like with the with the motocross riders wear. I just bought it 10 years ago and I ride with it and I like it. It's it, the airbag vests probably do more to cushion your head if you get tossed off. But I just, you know, I just like having it there. Do I ride every ride with it? Probably not, but I will take it on road trips and day long day rides in the twisties and what deer season and stuff like that. I'm mindful to wear this because I might be coming off the motorcycle airbag vest. A lot of people have them. I know people that have them. They're a little cumbersome, but if you have it on when you get thrown, but again, that is helping with the third hit, the first two hits, the first two collisions that happen where we get injured because of the design of the motorcycle or what's in front of us on the handlebars is irrelevant with that airbag vest or neck brace. I, mean, I think that's very dangerous, but I think it's probably the only way he could get his wife to ride with him or whatever. But uh, you'd be happy to know that this product is called the babe cage, which I think is, I think the name's even more entertaining than looking at it. Entrepreneur ideas. You guys familiar with like the back off light cameras uh, or I'm sorry, lights that flash in the back of your head. So we have, um, there, there's two of them out there in view that one, a local person has been working on for years, probably 10 years. This guy's been trying to promote this in view, which is a turn signal integrated in there. You got back the back off one. It's on, um, they were on shark tank. Uh, it's, it's like you, when you slow down, it just decelerates and it, it puts the light on there. There are entrepreneurs that are out there that are trying to make riding safer. So these are some of the ideas I came up with. First of all, an aftermarket airbag, you know, like that you could put on your own motorcycle. Now, again, we got private parts up here. Okay. This is a delicate area, but you know, you think a company like Saddleman or Corbin, you know, I mean, 
could they integrate an airbag into their seats, right? So, so you want to compete with Corbin, you want to compete, come up with some kind of airbag that will come out of there. Again, we're talking a lot of liability issues there probably, right? If you're sitting on the seat wrong or you got a kid sitting on your lap or this kind of stuff, I get it, right? Maybe that's a terrible place to have it come out, but I just see the seat is something that's easily removed and replaced, right? So could someone sell a specialty seat that could be purchased and put on the motorcycle? Like think about a crash guard, you know, you buy um, engine guards, they just, you buy them, they bolt on, it's an easy swap, takes you 20 minutes or an hour to install. Again, it, it is a very delicate subject to have the airbag explode out from the seat. Now, this this was the Dionysi air ja air jacket or whatever that was now there was no tether involved. Now one of the things that struck me was remember we're hitting things in front of us, okay? The back that's going to help us if we get tossed for the third hit. The back. Why don't we have it so that the airbag vest as soon as it deploys takes all the CO2 and expansion of the airbag, just thrust it forward on our body. You know, cause like if I run into a, the side of a minivan with an, with an airbag vest on, it'll help me once I'm already toast. Whereas if the airbag is designed to only thrust forward the, the expulsion of, of, of air, that could do the same thing as an airbag like would do that you mounted to your motorcycle. Cause now whichever direction you go in front of you, it, it could absorb the energy. Uh, they already have this product for elderly people that fall. So we know that this is something. So from a person falling, that action can deploy hip airbags that prevent broken hips. So, I just don't, I see a conversion, okay, of technologies that are out there. And then of course, I think the universal airbag system, you know, just, God, can you imagine something you could bolt to your handlebars that could, it just bolts to your handlebars. You buy it from RevZilla, you know what I mean? And just the thing blows up in front of you. Then I was thinking, so this is a V-Strom. We could see the slope here, but what if you were able to do something like sell a product that, that would be maybe a Teflon material, okay? Something that's slippery, that reduces the angle, that allows you to slide, not hold you up, not pin you, you know? Just again, I, I don't know where you'd even begin designing it to sell it. But I, I guess with, with, with that in mind, you could, you could think about doing that. Would it just selling a, a wax, maybe you just sell a wax that is makes your tank like real slippery. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like this is a, a you know, but then you got to, Hey, why do I want a slippery tank? Well, now people got to know that you want a slippery tank for this. So again, there's a lot of education problems with a lot of this uh, type of stuff. I mean, if you're someone that sits down with real professionals, okay, and, and thinks about a, a, something that can really, I mean, imagine this, like, like the, um, the flashing lights and things like that, the, the, the brake lights on your helmet, they did that because they want to save lives, you know? Well, if you really want to save lives, um, it's, we're not getting, we're getting rear-ended but maybe more in the city. Okay. Maybe more in like New York city that happens. But I mean, according to, to studies, we don't really get rear-ended as much as we have forward problems. A light on the back of your helmet that flickers when you slow down is an easier problem to solve. It's an easier product to build, but, but, there's other opportunities out there. Just compensate for design flaws. Take a class, read a book, watch videos, uh, take a look at your motorcycles, try to make them safer. Uh, 
you think second thoughts about certain tank bags or certain windshields or this and that just just to at least now you have a more expanded thought process when it comes to crashing but i just i just wish that the uh that the big the big dogs would would you know start to think about this as they build them 